Our second HEPEX seminar of the week, in fact, second CMS HEPEX seminar of the week. Um, our speaker today is Mark Weinberg, who joins us today from Florida State, uh, working mostly at LPC, I believe, on the CMS experiment. And we'll be talking today about Snell specifically. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I, I, I found out I'm, I'm the second this week because uh, Albert Rock was also here. So I can follow him. But I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this idea, generally this mechanism of stealth supersymmetry and how uh, how it's looked for uh, at the LEC and specifically at CMS. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to split this in, so the majority of it I'll talk about what has actually been done by us. But I also, the, the second half, is, the second part is a little bit more speculative in the sense that I very much like uh, ideas and input about how we can pursue this best. So I have a few opinions myself, but I'd, I'd love more input about how we can best pursue this at uh, run two. So I sometimes I give myself like an experimental checklist, like things that I as an experimentalist would very much like to see coming out of the LHC. Um, and I think uh, almost certainly we've done the first thing on it, uh, discovered a Higgs. Uh, and all, it's very, I guess you can have your own opinion about whether you should check this box. Very probably it is the Higgs. Um, the, the remaining questions that I would like to see answered are all kind of of the same flavor. I would, I would love an answer to the hierarchy problem. Uh, why is it that the Higgs seems so much lighter than the apparent unification scale? Um, I would like to see some kind of answer about gauge coupling unification. And, and this is maybe most important, I would, I would like to see an answer to what dark matter is. I would like to, in fact, I'd like to directly produce dark matter in the LHC. Um, and the, the thing that I want to emphasize about all three of these uh, is that Susie is, uh, provides an answer for each of these. So the status of supersymmetry of the LHC at the end of run one is, is much as, as, as we have here, uh, just shown in ICHA. Um, so typically speaking, it is, by convention, the majority of SUSE searches uh, assume a few things. First of all, you have some kinematically accessible, either Lumina or Spark, uh, so that you have strongly produced SUSE. Um, you have some relatively uncompressed spectrum, uh, so you don't live in a particularly weird region of phase space, and you generally assume art parity conservation. And as a result of the art parity conservation, you generally assume that you have the lightest, stable, supersymmetric particle. Uh, so because of this, um, you typically have significant missing transverse energy from the LSP, uh, also occasionally in RPD models, and generally top quarks. <coughs> you assume that you have a light spark in the case of um, So because of this, uh, so these, these models, these sort of simplest models, are all broadly excluded, uh, depending on your flavor, are typically excluded out to, you know, a order of 10 meters. Um, and generally speaking, there are two kinds of ways to get at uh, to get at these uh, Susie signatures. Uh, one is uh, the sort of more sledgehammer approaches, where you just do jet plus met, and you rely on your high missing energy to suppress uh, your standard model backgrounds. And the other are the maybe sort of more um, uh, subtle signatures, where you rely on some strange feature that you wouldn't expect in the standard model, like same sun electrons, for example, where you suppress your uh, your standard model background. So, uh, so the question that we would like to ask, so you know, of course we haven't seen Susie, so, uh, so is it possible that Susie's hiding? Uh, I sometimes, I have this, uh, I, I actually stole this slide from, uh, or this picture from a, a friend of mine who also works on Stealth. Um, and I, I like to, every so often I like to look back and to remind me not to, to miss things as these, as these dogs are unfortunately done. Um, so it could be, it is possible that we are, we are looking where we should not. Right, so it's possible that it's hiding in any of a variety of ways. Um, for one, it, for one thing, it could be hiding the theory. There could be there are various ways that we could imagine that Susie is Susie has, has conformed itself in such a way to hide from from our searches in the theory. Like perhaps it has some very large splitting between the squark and whatever it decays into, such that you end up with just one very high BT jet. Even this actually would probably be fairly accessible to us. But, but things with large hierarchies or low jet multiplicities would, would, could potentially hide from us. Um, you could have just no strong production, right? So these electroweak you know, models say maybe, maybe a, this Susie's not strongly produced, and as a result, the cross-sections are reduced. Uh, and then finally, there are, these, there are a few models that you could imagine where you have, generally speaking, Susie produces these large cascades. If you cascade to things that are very soft, 
then it's possible you can imagine you don't reconstruct any of them as a jet, and you miss it for this reason. So it all just kind of looks like noise in your detector. But it could be that it is hiding in the experiment. Um, it is possible that SUSY, so because MET is such a near universal feature of these <coughs> types of searches, it's possible that SUSY could evade these limits by having little or no MET. And there are a few different ways to do this. The most obvious is our party violation. If there's our party violation, there doesn't need to be a stable LSP. Um, you could also have a, sort of a weird coincidentally compressed spectrum. Uh, so you end up with, let's say, your Spark and your uh, and your LSP very close together in mass. So the LSPs end up coming out back to back and your MET just happened. So while you do have hard, fat, hard heavy uh, LSPs, they're coming out back to back and, and you're not, and you're missing the MET this way. Uh, and the third and, and possibly most robust method is the one I want to talk about today at least, uh, is this idea of substitute, uh, where we posit an extra hidden sector. And what this buys us is a sort of a light, we keep our LSP, but it ends up being light and soft. So I'd like to just start off by broadly talking about the, uh, the mechanism itself, the mechanism of self. Um, so the question is, is it possible to produce low met SUSY events without specifically violating our parity or, or fine tuning our mass spectrum? Um, and the answer is, sure. Uh, it costs you a little extra complexity. In this case, it costs you an extra hidden sector. Um, this is maybe something that'll be uh, not too crazy for people here because uh, this was uh, one of the people who originally invented this was Josh Ruderman, uh, who uh, does a lot of work with hidden sectors and hidden valleys and things like this. And so let me suggest that we already know that we have one hidden sector, the Susie breaking sector. So let's just add another one called the cell sector, and we will imagine that the couplings between these two sectors are either absent or highly suppressed. And as a result of this, stealth, the cell sector experiences no SUSY breaking. So it is, it is, it is SUSY in this, in this sector is an unbroken symmetry, or largely unbroken. Presumably it experiences some breaking you know, via the NSSM. But broadly speaking, what we expect is that we will end up with particles that live in the same <coughs> sector which are, who are nearly degenerate with their superpartners. Uh, now, this sector can, in principle, be as rich as you like, but minimally, it has to include some singlet state and the superpartner of the singlet state. So that's what we assume for the sake of, of this search. Um, so you need this hidden sector. You then need a portal that communicates between the hidden sector and the MSSM, uh, and this allows you'll have a, a decay chain that eventually decays into the hidden sector and then back out of the hidden sector. I'll, I'll show the, the exact diagram in a moment. Uh, and then you need some kind of very light uh, r parity odd state. Typically, it, it doesn't particularly matter, but, but typically you assume that it's the gravitino. Um, and then this is produced in the stealth decay. Uh, so the singlino decaying to a singlet plus the gravitino. And because the, bear in mind, the singlino and the singlet are nearly mass degenerate, so the particle produced from them, this, this gravitino is not only light, but also soft. So OK, so here's the specific <coughs> model that we look at. So we, we start from a simplified model, uh, where we assume some dispark production. So you have two sparks coming out that produce jets, and then what would be your LSP, your neutral ink. Um, but here, and, so, and, and I, I want to emphasize, this diagram here is happening on each side. So you have your spark that decays to your lightest visible particle. It could either be, so we, we consider both cases, actually. We have uh, one analysis that I'll show today where we assume that it's a neutralino, uh, and one where we assume it's a charging node. And then it can decay. Um, and, and from here, it can decay into, generally into a vector boson. Uh, we consider the cases where they both decay into photons or where they both decay into values. This was largely just a hand power issue. I'd like, to, I'd like to hit all six of the possible choices. Um, but this is good because it, it broadly would let us define, it would let us characterize this part of the world based on its decay properties. So the neutralino or chargino, so this, this particle that would be the LSP then decays into the hidden sector. And then this and then it decays back out of the hidden sector here, producing a couple more blue uh, and your LSP. So the, the the general signature for this model is just um, is just uh, two vector bosons and a lot of jets and little or no missing energy. Um, by the way, if, if people have questions, I don't know what the convention is, but, but if you guys have questions, by all means, feel free to interrupt. Um, 
So this is so as I said, so so jets plus a couple of vector bosons. Um, so in our <coughs> particular case, uh, we look at so we look at a mineral salt sector, and we assume uh, that the splitting is held is small. So this is this is a feature of the model that the splitting between the singlet and the singlet is small. We take 10 GeV uh, with a singlet at 100 GeV, and we look at a range of squark and neutralino masses. Um, How does this singlet decay to our uh, the, so, how does, so this guy happens through some whatever portal portal it is that communicates between the hidden sector and. You can absolutely. You can exactly. You can reproduce. You could get a, a whole. In fact, I think Atlas specifically. I, I, I've seen almost the same diagram from Atlas talks where their their point is that you get these displaced jets, and and this is the thing that they are most interested in. So if you boost up the mass of whatever it is that's going on here, or you just go back to recently. If, if, you, if you boost it, if you make it too heavy, then this never decays until it leaves your particle and, or it leaves your detector and, and you end up back where you started with the nesting energy. So those for sure would be constrained by the, ge the generic SUSE searches. Um, but your portal particle has to be very heavy to get to be that long lived. That's, uh, and so, I mean, like typically, well, I guess as you know, I mean, typically you expect, uh, you know, seed towers of like, you know, millimeters or so. Right, or, or maybe maybe you should just know it was D or or in the uh, hidden valleys. It's, it's it's between uh, ten to the minus twenty five and ten to the plus twenty five. <laughs> that's a that's a long range to search. For sure, if it's more than you know whatever the the, the length of the detector is, then you get back to your original uh, your original problem. Um, but yes, absolutely, and, and it's also, I mean, it's worth noting, I should, I should mention because, because uh, the question's been asked here, but the portal particle also has to be involved at this juncture as well, otherwise you'd have, uh, you'd have a photon, for example, coupling something to that charge. But if you have a coupling of uh, S2 gluons, uh, shouldn't you have the S channel for the original production? Yes, absolutely. And if you have the mass around like 100 GU, you should produce quite a lot. You, so the well, it depends on how high you set your portal particle for sure. But you can so the, the cross section for this. I mean, so the basically we're talking about the reverse production of this, and this will definitely so the the place where you'd naturally see it is two gluons going to single yes. back two gluons. But this would easily high in here. The QCD cross section is so enormous that with even just very modest assumptions on the mass of the portal particle, this would be a stealth. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. I mean, so, but I mean, like, uh, you can. I mean, the uh, I forget what what the portal particle masses are typically set to, or the couplings. But I mean, it, the the requirements that you not see it above the QCD background are are so modest as to be as to be nearly vanishing. Um, but that's right. I mean, you, you would you would not you would not want to tune things such that you end up. Uh, Seeing, seeing the reverse process, seeing, seeing a significant excess of glue glue to glue glue, for sure. Um, but this is broadly, and, and uh, this is broadly the, the picture that I, I, I want people to keep in mind. Uh, so a quark from the squark, a couple of quarks from the singlet, and and a, a vector boson from the you know, the charging you know, the and then a, a very soft. So I also wanted to talk very briefly about the sensitivity of searches that have already been done. Um, I, I give a few examples here, things that I think would be sort of natural, uh, natural questions to ask. So the natural question to ask is why, the most natural question I suppose is why conventional SUSE searches don't see this. And the, the reason is just because uh, SUSE searches to the LHC typically require significant MET. So, so for example, you might say, well, well, here you have a W, and the W produces a couple of neutrinos, and those neutrinos make missing energy, and so why wouldn't you see it, why wouldn't we be back to where you started? And the answer is that we specifically tune our cuts to the LHC to get rid of exactly electroweak scale uh, met, right? So we, we tune to 100, or even in this Atlas case, 150 is our, is our minimum cut, specifically so we get rid of those, uh, those you know, W decays, for example. Um, and we see here, this was from the original stealth paper. So this is the kind of MET we expect to see. And indeed, if you have a conventional Beano LSP, you get, I don't even know where this is being, but a couple hundred GV probably. So you'd, you'd certainly see this, but you certainly wouldn't see any of the small mass cases for stealth. The other uh, 
This will come up in a bit because we use a very similar search methodology, but you could ask why the black hole search doesn't see it. And the reason for this is just that it's dominated by the background. So uh, by virtue of the fact that the black hole search is very inclusive, it looks for anything, really, just object multiplicity. Uh, it is dominated by the case where all of your objects are jets. Um, and because our final state has a couple of vector bosons in it, this would be completely swamped by, by the corresponding um, so the, so you know, if you look at just diphotons, that'll lie orders of magnitude below it. Uh, and the last case is why this is different from compressed SUSY. Um, and the answer for this is just that with compressed SUSY, you have what is essentially very delicately balanced met. So you have, you have high mass, uh, hard invisible particles coming out in both directions. And they're just, they just happen to be perfectly balanced. So as a result, these signatures are not robust against ISR. So as I don't understand. Because uh, monojet, for example, the you know, stress object is making the opposite to ISR. ISR is the the, it's not bad. So, well, they're different. You, so if it's not balanced once you have your ISR. Yes. That's right. That's what I'm saying is, is compressed SUSY yes. would be visible in mono X. Oh. Yes, whereas no matter how much ISR you have in self, you still wouldn't see it. But that's exactly my point, is that, is that once you have an ISR kick, all bets are off. Now your net is not exquisitely balanced and comes out one side or the other. So uh, the mono X searches are sensitive to compress using in a way that they are not to self. <coughs> so how, do, how does one do Does anyone has done? What? Has anyone done the monojet and stuff like this? Yes, oh yeah, so we have mono photon and mono jet, yeah. and uh, I think mono top is in the pipeline. Um, yes, and, and I think at least in the mono jet case, they have set some limit on compressed Susie. It, it's. Yeah, I know, that's why I know about the stress. Oh, has... self. Oh, uh, no, no one's bothered. I, you, you can show right away, like, you just from looking at the diagram, you can see that even with an ISR kick, you still have, somewhere along the way, you still have your. Singlino decaying to a singlet. So there just is no kinematic phase space for this, no matter how fast this whole system is going. You can, you can boost this as much as you like, and there will still be no kinematic space for this, uh, this, uh, this gravitino to get away from the, uh, from the gluons. So no, uh, I, you, you wouldn't set any kind of limit with a uh, mono Okay. So how, how does one do, so met, Unfortunately, is a is a wonderful handle on especially on the GCD. Uh, so how does one do searches without net? We looked at a lot of different options, um, and, and in fact, we may we may kind of look at these options again. Um, the very first thing that we kind of looked at um, was these invariant masses and various kinematic variables for intermediate resonances. So our our first idea was that we could do something where. Uh, we try to reconstruct, say, the singlino mass from the, getting the right two jets, or so reconstruct the neutralino mass from the right two jets plus the right, the right vector boson. But what we found is we were just getting killed by the combinatorics backgrounds. So this, and also, uh, it's worth noticing that we were, we were becoming more and more uh, dependent on the particular model choices that we made. Um, so we eventually abandoned this, and we came up with the idea of using what black holes use. Um, this this sort of naive scalar sum of the, uh, of the final state particle. So for the ST, this ST distribution, all we do is just add up in the dumbest possible way all the particles in the event. So the PT of all the particles in the event. Um, and what ends up happening is, so I'll, I'll sort of show this later and, and motivate this a bit more, but this ST distribution turns out to scale very nicely. Um, and maybe I'll wait to give my thoughts on why it scales nicely. Um, but because it scales nicely, it provides a very nice background estimation. So once we have this ST, this idea that our, our, uh, our signal will produce high ST, then our selection requirements are very general. So we, we need something, a high ST. Uh, we need something with, in, in the first case, I'll look specifically at the photons. So we need something with two photons and something with many jets. We need to be six, more, more than four. Um, and our event selection, so here's, here's the detailed event selection. So broadly speaking, we have a baseline selection where we have at least one photon of 15 GeV and at least two jets of 30 GeV. 
the, the deputy was upped because, uh, as it turns out, the scaling, this, this very nice scaling, which holds quite well, is largely spoiled by the appearance of pileup in the detector. And with the normal pileup suppression techniques plus a PT cut, we were able to get rid of almost all of them. Um, and then uh, we have no MET requirement, but it's worth noting that if you see more than 15 GeV of MET in the event, then you add it to the ST. Um, and then from here, we have two selection regions. Uh, we have a search region, um, with, which was taken with one trigger, and these ET requirements were a function of the trigger they were taken with. Uh, so it was a diphoton trigger. So the search region requires at least two photons with, with high PT. Um, and then we have a control region with exactly one photon. And it was taken with an HT trigger, so it has to have an HT greater than 800. Um, in case it comes up, uh, this is largely an artifact <coughs> because we had an additional region that I won't talk about, which was sort of a validation region. And we wanted to make each of the three regions orthogonal. So we also required that our photon be less than 75 GB. So the backgrounds of the diphoton search uh, broadly fall into, the, I mean, they're, they're essentially all QCD with, with sort of usually with prompt photon production. Uh, so the diphoton product, the diphoton background is sort of like things like Born and Bremsterol and the box diagram. And then there's, uh, this is dominant, but only slightly subdominant is the, uh, is the photon plus jet background with one misidentified jet. Um, and because these backgrounds come from so many different places with so many different diagrams, the goal was to obtain the background contributions directly from data using this ST scaling method. So let me talk about how this works exactly. Um, the idea is that for whatever reason, the shape of the ST distribution seems to be independent of the number of objects in your final state. Um, that is to say, the ST distribution, once you've normalized properly, the ST distribution for three jets looks the same as the ST distribution for five jets or six jets or seven jets or whatever. Um, I, will, I will give a, a, a brief attempt to motivate why this might be true. The, the, the broad argument is that usually when you look at, when you sum up the PT of the objects in the event, what you're really doing, if you're looking at QCD, you're not really looking at a five jet event. What you're really looking at is a die jet event where because of the hadronization process, you've, you've split into three or four or five jets. So when you naively just take their scalar sum, what you're really doing is you're reproducing the, the Q hat from the, uh, from the QCD. So it should just scale. Um, I, have, I have attempted to use that argument in theory-heavy rooms, and, and theorists aren't always too thrilled with that because many of them have pointed out that uh, that is true but might naively be expected to be spoiled by loop order corrections. So then I just I fall back on the position that it is more of an experimental fact. Um, but so let's assume, so I'll, 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 you should maybe prove it in a moment that ST doesn't need scale, but assuming that you agree with me for the moment that ST scales, then this means that our shape can be determined from the low jet multiplicity region and will be identical in the high jet multiplicity region. So I can determine the overall shape of the ST distribution in cases where I have two or three jets, and then I can determine, and then I can use that shape, and I can normalize it in some region with relatively low ST, and that gives my, me my overall normalization. So that tells, so I have my shape, and I know about where to put it, and then I let it go, and this tells me uh, the distribution of events that I expect in my signal region with both high ST and high jet multiplicity. So okay, so so does ST scaling actually work? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so it definitely for sure works in the black hole case. Uh, so this is scaling in the inclusive case, really, but, but the case where we're dominated by, by all hadronic uh, events. Um, and we see here that when we have this, um, so this is, a, this is in simulation and this is in the actual data. And we see here that if we simulate with Pythia various numbers of jets, and they all scale beautifully, right? So this is normalized we're right around here in this bin, and ever after that, the shapes look exactly the same. They track each other beautifully. Uh, and you see the same thing here. So you see the same thing in data, data in Monte Carlo. In both cases, uh, this ST scales beautifully. Um, so it, it for sure works well in the case where you are dominated by hadronic events. But does it work when you have photons? So to check this, we looked in two different cases. Uh, 
in one bit, for one thing, we looked in the we looked in the data in our control region. So by requiring one photon, uh, we looked in the data, and then we looked in our search region in the simulation. Um, and what we see is uh, the scaling was great in the data. So I would say that this is consistent with no deviation whatsoever in the data. Uh, in the Monte Carlo search region, <coughs> so the scaling looks really magnificent for almost everything. So, so here, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, as a brief aside, uh, this bottom part is the ratio of n jets to the three jet bin, which is what we actually used. So here we see that for everything but five or more, the scaling looks really wonderful, right? I mean, this is this is looks fantastic. Uh, you might argue that there is leaving out this last bin. There is a slight indication of an ex of, of a growing function to the five or more bin. So this was included as a systematic. So it it turns out uh, when when you fit to so so to do this, we fit to our largest deviation to, to estimate this systematic. So we fit to our largest deviation. This amounts to about a 10% change in, uh, in the fit parameter and about a 15% increase in the overall background rate. So this was included as an uncertainty. So I, have, I mentioned briefly that we use uh, four or more as our signal regions, but I kind of wanted to motivate this by showing a sort of temperature plot for the signal. Um, the idea here, the thing that I wanted to emphasize is that so we do a statistical combination of both four and five or more. And that's always, you're never, you're never wrong to do that. Um, it's always useful to combine more bins statistically. Uh, but these specifically give us enhanced contributions in specific regions. Uh, so, and I wanted to kind of indicate why. So in the five or more jet bin, we are most sensitive basically where we expect to be most sensitive. So here on the, on the y-axis, we have the neutralino mass. On the x-axis, we have the squark mass. And in the case where those are well separated, like if you just kind of take a line through the middle here, then sure enough, we are, we are very sensitive to uh, signal points uh, where the, these, two, these two masses are well separated. Where we lose is along this diagonal. So in the case where your squark mass, I'm sorry, your neutralino mass starts to drift up very close to your squark mass, you lose sensitivity, and the reason for this, if, you, if you'll allow me to go back to the diagram, the reason for this is, so now we're saying that our squark is very close to our neutralino. So our neutralino is very close to our squark. So that means that this quark is becoming very soft, and as a result, we're losing a quark on each side. So our five or six jet events are becoming four jet events. So specifically, in those regions where we're close to the diagonal, our four jet bin really helps us kind of a diagrammatic representation of that. So here are the results from the search. Um, so the, here, so the, the, the dark blue line you can kind of see here indicates uh, the expected background, and the, blue, and the light blue band around is the systematic uncertainty. Uh, the normalization region I've shown here, it's, it, you can kind of see that it's slightly shaded here at the end, and that's where the, that's where the shape is normalized. And I've given a couple of uh, signal points here, both at, at about 900 GeV for the squark mass. Uh, just to illustrate this point that I made on the last slide, I, I wanted to emphasize that the, the light red bar here, uh, this is kind of a typical point where the squark and neutralino are well separated. So here we do better in the five jet bin. But if you look over here, this is the other point is where the neutralino mass is close to the squark mass, so there it does better. Basically, just what I said on the last slide. Um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, as you can see from the data, uh, we don't see any significant excess. Uh, what's the what are your error bars? What's that? What are your error bars? Ah, these are these are Poisson error bars. You mean for the data? Yeah. Yeah, these are Poisson. Don't they look kind of a little too good for this? What's the guy's error bar? For the error bars on the data? You think, uh, how do you mean? The, the kind that I don't know, if, even if I throw away systematic answer, it kind of looks too good to... Uh, so the, uh, <coughs> the systematic uncertainty is, is all no, on the, the background expectation. Just look at the curve and the, what's the guy's square for these points on this? Are you subtracting something in this or? Oh, uh, something no, 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 this is just a direct comparison. This is a direct comparison of the expected background where the shape was determined in the three-jet bin 
to and, and, and extrapolated out to the four jet bin and compared directly to data. It looks uh, don't be fooled. While it is quite good, you know, that's uh, the agreement between the points and the yeah, it's not that bad. Uh, this is so the expected background here. If you integrate this, uh, comes I mean, I'm to saying it's too good. Uh, what, what probability out of you know getting a distribution like this getting such a good agreement is very small, probably. Uh, well, I, so you know, so here you, uh, I would say that you are you are exactly so we're kind of cherry picking. I would say that here the agreement. So the expected background is 22 events plus or minus about seven, uh, and the number of events we see is 19. And there are no subtractions, there are no systematic uncertainties in there. The, uh, the systematic uncertainties are exactly characterized by the light blue line. But here, I would say it's not quite so good, right? Here, so we expect, uh, um, let's see, how so we get 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13. We expected, uh, I mean, we expect here. Here we were off by the, we, were, we, we fluctuated about a sigma low. Um, but, I mean, but getting, Seeing 19 events when you expected 22 is not, I, I would. I no, it's not about the number of events, it's about the shape falling so close. <coughs> that's why so maybe you're subtracting something or no. there is I mean, something that. Uh, I mean, wouldn't we like. Uses. So I would, I would say that this is exactly the claim that I'm making that ST scaling works, right? I mean, so I, I, I'm using no, no, the correct shape. All I'm saying is it's just it's very simple statistical thing. Probability of getting chi square of divided by the number of degrees of freedom of 0 0.05 is very unlikely. You have to be very lucky to... Oh, yeah, but this is the chi-squared of 0 0.05. This is, I mean, you like a chi-squared per degree of freedom of maybe half. That's not a so, that distribution. No? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is not... Yeah. I don't, I mean... First two points are zero, right? They're right in there. Oh, oh so, I'm sorry. Do so not, you can't look at this point because it's specifically zero. normalized to this point. The, so, so this, the fact that the blue okay. line passes directly through this black line here is, is, yeah, is by construction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this is signal <coughs> Yeah, in the model that we use, so we, we look at the two different cases where we have two photon and, and two electron, or, uh, electron muon. And in both cases, we assume 100% branching fraction, fraction too. So you could, uh, you know, I'll show the limit in a moment, and you could kind of, you could, you could make the, the limits less terrifying by uh, by assuming some sort of reasonable branching fractions to each of them. But yeah, in our particular case, we didn't want to assume something from the model. I have a comment. I think this plot will be not so misleading if you. Will, uh, Plot the number of expected events as a number of events, but not as a smooth curve. Ooh. Because it should be a step. Uh, so, function. but it was the the expected background was indeed. I mean, it, it's it's not a step function. It is it is parameterized by a curve. It's parameterized by e raised to uh, x log yeah. x natural log y. Yeah, but but to compare with the data, it's better to have it just as a step. I not okay. not as a smooth yeah. function. And you will you will never find in the data like eight point five events, and actually. Uh, sure, but you often get background expectations of eight point five, right? I mean, so this would be very conventional, and I, I might argue that it would be a little bit misleading to put a step function here when a step function wasn't used as the as for the expected background. Like this, this represents exactly the functional form that was used in the analysis. I, I, I suppose, I mean, we could, I, mean, I, I, I suppose that's just sort of semantic, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, if it would, if it would clarify things, that may help. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, because we actually, by and large, we see fewer events than we expect, um, we can safely set a limit on SUSY, on stealth SUSY with photons. Um, so in this case, uh, so I, we use the sort of no, usual conventions. So the, the color scale denotes uh, the 95% cross section, the 95% uh, confidence level upper limit on the on the signal model cross section, um, and the contours specifically represent uh, the observed limit and the expected limit. Um, one thing that I so for to, to perform this, uh, we use we combine statistically the four and five or more jet bins. 
And the limits were not, in the previous analysis, the limits were just cut and count. So we just set some optimized ST threshold and counted the number of events before that. Um, but in this case, uh, we, we specifically, we did a more sophisticated shape limit where we included the expected shape from the signal, the shape of the background, and the shape of the, of the data. So um, what we see is that for typical neutralino masses, we exclude out to about a little over 1,000, 10, 50 or so. Um, it would also, maybe it's worth mentioning, um, this little area in here. Um, so we see a reduction in the, in the limit as we get very, very light um, neutralinos here. And I thought I would also go back to the original plot to kind of illustrate this. So as you get very light neutralinos, this whole system is quite boosted. So as a result, you've got a, a squark decaying to a very light neutralino, and that causes your vector boson and your two jets to become very tightly collimated. And this ends up spoiling your photon isolation. So if you have isolation requirements on your photon, you will lose that photon. And that's exactly why, in the case where you have very light neutralinos, you end up with these, these reduced, uh, the reduced limit here. Can you do some jets of structure there? Yes, yes. Uh, I believe, I definitely believe we could. Um, and we will. Uh, that's actually, I, I said that that was going to happen, or I, I say in the future that that's going to happen uh, at 13 TV, but there's also someone at Rutgers who is, who is specifically taking these models and trying to find uh, a photon that gets stuck inside a, inside a big jet. So it is, it, it's exactly these boosted topologies that would, uh, that would benefit most from that. So I also wanted to mention these uh, stealth searches with lepton. So the other side of this is that you could have a chargino, and this chargino decays to a W, which goes leptonically. Uh, and so that's what we assume here. here with the photon case, it was the first time we were doing it. And so, or I'm sorry, in the photon case, we were, we were improving upon an analysis that had already been done. Uh, so we did some slightly more sophisticated things that we've done than we've done the first time around, including setting a two-dimensional limit. For the lepton side, this is the first time it's been done. And so we, uh, because of manpower issues, we didn't try to do quite so much. Um, one of the things that we did is we made an additional assumption on the charging node. So we said now that we would only look at charginos that were half the mass of the spark. So the idea was to put us broadly kind of in the middle of, these, of this two-dimensional uh, plane. So something where you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be putting yourself into, into a place where your, your charging was very close to your spark. You wouldn't be putting yourself into a place where it was very light. It would just be kind of medium-ish. Um, so what we see for this is the, the primary background for this is, is leptonic TT bar. Um, and we tried using ST, but it turns out that ST scaling does not work quite so well in, in the case where you have a W or a Z. Um, I don't even know whether I should, maybe I will because it's a CMS collaboration. So it, when, one of the things that we noticed was that the scaling for W, Z, and TT bar separately were all pretty bad. But if you put them together, for whatever reason, the scaling seemed to go pretty nicely. Um, we assumed that was an accident, and so we didn't use it. <laughs> it was a little bit strange. Uh, so instead, instead the, the methodology for this is that we use a series of control samples and we take the basic shape from our Monte Carlo and then we adjust the shape based on these control samples, shape and normalization based on control samples. So here are the control section, the control samples that we use for each of these. So our, our primary background is the top and so we get our top shape, uh, bear in mind that for our signal, uh, we're assuming a light, we're assuming a, a squark corresponding to a light quark. So our signal has no B jets, which is nice because it allows us uh, a very natural, uh, uh, very natural control region for our top shape. So we can insist for our top shape reconstruction region that we have at least two B jets, and then this will make us very much dominated by top. So it, it has the same number of lept, it has the same lepton characteristics, but in this case it has four jets, I'm sorry, well, two jets and two B10 jets. Um, and so the, the top shape is determined here, and the overall normalization is determined from the case where we have uh, zero B10 jets, uh, but less than four jets. And then this normalized, reshaped top distribution is used in the final results. Uh, the drill yan is comparatively small. The, the main contribution of this, I think, is just 
Australia and going to Tau Tau, where one Tau goes to a new, one Tau goes to a new. This is, depending on the signal point, between 1 and 10%. Um, you, it's closer to 10%, and then, then maybe you know, 1 or 2% from non prompt where you're either getting a, a, a lepton that's coming from a, a B-jet, say, or, or a jet that's faking. Um, and in both cases, we have good control regions for those. So Drell Yan, you can, you can isolate very well just by requiring two opposite sign muons. Non-prompt, you can isolate very well just by requiring two same sign opposite flavor muons. So this is the background estimation for the lepton analysis. So we're specifically looking in the 2B tag region. And, and we're looking at the agreement between TTR, well, between everything and, and the data in this control sample. So in all cases, uh, the corrections that were applied are broadly consistent with unity. Um, they're quite small, but we see that the slight corrections were applied here, like so the data exceeds the, the top a little bit here. Um, so broadly, the TT bar shape was determined from this sample, and the normalization is determined from the zero B tag, the less than three jet sample, and then and small contributions for everything else. So that this shape is applied to the results so these are the results when applied to, to the actual data in the signal region. Um, so we see that the signal produces events with many jets. Um, and in order, to, uh, in order to estimate the, um, uh, the limits for this, uh, we, we go back to the original cut and count methodology of the original paper. So in this case, we, we use three different optimized ST thresholds. We just use the ZDI method for deciding what our ST thresholds would be. And the three that we came out with, depending on spark mass, uh, were SD greater than 300, greater than 700, or greater than 1200. Uh, and so we just set our threshold here and count all the events above that. Um, it's worth noting that the dominant systematic uncertainty for this analysis comes entirely from the statistical uncertainty on the top shape. So these, this is our uh, 1D limit on, uh, on self with leptons. Um, so we find uh, the spark mass, the, the limit on the spark mass, where we have an electron and muon in these four jets. And <coughs> here, uh, we can actually do a little bit better uh, statistically. So we can combine the four, five, six, and seven or jet bins. Um, and we just do a standard cut and count for this. Uh, and when we do this, we get broadly, uh, like we broadly exclude spark masses with reasonable neutralino masses uh, to about 550. So that is, that's essentially the content of the paper. Um, and, and having said that, so this is, this is the sort of the state of affairs at the end of run one, but I also wanted to motivate some new ideas for run two and, and possibly get some ideas. Um, so I wanted to look, take a look at low meta analyses in run two. Um, I think there will be, for starters, I think there will be a substantial increase in sensitivity uh, as we go up. And so generally speaking, we expect factors of about 20 or so uh, increases in the gluino pair cross-sections. Um, one thing I tried to do was I tried to model this using very naive assumptions about what we'd see at 13 TV. So I expected a, a factor of two increase in the background, and I had a predicted signal efficiency of around 30% or so. Um, <coughs> and with this, I think that our reach extends noticeably. So we go from a little over 1,000 to about 1,300. So I think that... With even 10 G, uh, I'm sorry, 10 inverse femtovarns of data, we can expect it to significantly improve on the limit that we see. Well, we could find new supersymmetry uh, out farther than a thousand. I want to assume what's Where would the discovery find? What's that? Where would the five sigmas and sensitivity? That's a good question. I don't know. I didn't. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have the heart to, well, <laughs> to look for that. What's that? A lot of That's you're right. I uh, yeah, that's true. That's, maybe I was not up to this now. I want to. I, I want to believe, but um, I, I have to see some kind of excess before I start finding the the five sigma. And, and the three sigma limit would be like. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> not very optimistic, but not pessimistic. Right. <laughs> that is true. I mean, it, I should go back and look and see uh, see what kind of models we could have three sigma sensitivity to. That's a that's a good question. Okay, can I ask you, for, for this kind of model, is there an upper view to the masses where after these values when the model, model breaks down and they're free? Um, 
I, in terms of the, uh, let me think. So naively, I don't, you do have to make a couple decisions about the particles in your hidden sector. We put those at about the electroweak scale, so we just sort of decided by fiat that they'd be 190 GeV. Um, you could, I don't know, I don't know of anything that would break the system as you push the neutralino or the, the, the electroweak the agino and the spark masses up, uh, beyond that it would just become less natural. Um, but you could, um, in theory, I mean, so you, you could for sure uh, push the neutralino down far enough and start missing the photon because it's too soft. Uh, so there are, there are corners of phase space where you, you start to be in real trouble. Um, Can you produce a singlet uh, by brute force? Oh, uh, just like through the reverse mechanism? The, that was, I, I think that's a, a similar answer to the, the previous one, that hiding this behind just glue, glue to glue, glue would be very, very easy. So the, the, the dominant way you would see this would be glue glue goes through a singlet to glue glue. Probably you would look for a bump of vengeance, right? Yeah, yeah, but I don't think you'd ever see it beyond, like, your, your glue glue production is just too enormous. Yeah, it, I guess, yeah, it, you, could, you could make assumptions about your what's happening here that would make the, the so as you complete this. Unfortunately, they become displaced, it means carbon is too small. It's to yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. So you do, uh, you, it's for almost any assumption on the on the portal particles, I think you are safe from detection via the inverse process because QCD is so big. Um, well, it still depends on coupling, right? If that yeah. coupling is not that small, then you know, standard patch of pump so it's just fine. That's right, that's right, yeah. You, you, these, these impose very definite limits, but, but relatively weak limits on, on how big the coupling can be here. Um, and you can, you can, you can definitely make these numbers small enough that your, your gluvinos end up displaced. Um, and these would, and I think this is actually something that is worth seriously doing. I, I think I'm, I'm talking to the right people for this, but I, I think this is something seriously worth doing at, in run two, is looking for, uh, uh, for displaced vertices like this. Is there any preference of the gluons? Not particularly. No, I, I, I didn't. Uh, this was this was the idea. I generally I thought it, it made most sense to have this decay strongly uh, so that you get more jets in the event. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't have a strong preference for what these are. It's it has to jive with whatever you make your portal particles. But I, I think this is all worked out. It's uh, yeah. I, I suppose you could have other things. You probably just you probably just pay a price in cross uh, This seemed, I guess, I'd say this seemed like the the most gentle possible assumption to make because that it goes to jets. So uh, so for sure we can we can improve upon our reach from from the from run one maybe within the first year. Um, but I think that there are other interesting things to look at. Uh, for one, um, we really have not covered a lot of what there is to be covered. Um, so I've taken, we've taken the case where we, have, we end up with two photons and the case where we end up with two Ws. And this is, there's some justification for that because you're kind of covering the two poles. One where you have a very Beano-like neutralino and one where you have a very Wino-like neutralino. But there's, you know, I mean, there's six different decay modes, right? You know, you have like photon Z or ZW. And each of these, in principle, could be looked for. Uh, in addition, I was a little surprised to discover that um, uh, photon plus B jets uh, was not looked at in run one. I, it might be in the pipeline. I'm not 100% sure. But even the high net, like photon plus B jet plus met, I don't think there's a paper for this. And I think photon plus B jets would be a, a, a very characteristic signature of this. If we remove the assumption that these uh, squarks Correspond to light quarks, then you very naturally get B-jets. Uh, so this, I think, would be a very interesting would be a very interesting search. Uh, and then photon lepton, I think, would probe things like you know, like photon W. Um, but also, and I guess you, you mentioned this a little earlier, uh, <coughs> we have new ideas, right? I mean, so we can look at jet substructure techniques. There is, and there are kind of there are two that are are sort of weirdly correlated. 
there is um, there's this idea of intentional substructure where you really do have boosted topologies and you really are attacking the various pieces uh, that are just getting tightly collimated. And then there's this idea that I've been hearing from uh, Tim Cohen and a couple other people, Marcus Ludi, uh, about um, this idea of accidental substructure. I don't know if this shows up so well here. Maybe I'll, I have a backup slide that might sort of illustrate this a little better. Um, the idea of accidental substructure that uh, when you look at QCD, you're mostly looking at digit events with soft radiation. So you are, if you make these big fat jets, if you, if you make huge cluster jets in your uh, detector, um, the odds that you will accidentally cluster two small QCD jets and get a jet with an artificially high mass is small. But the odds that you'll do when you have some kind of new physics with like, you know, some crazy number of partons in there is quite high. So the, you get things that really are uncorrelated. These, these, the idea is that these guys have nothing to do with each other. But because there's just only so much space in the detector, they end up close to each other. And so if you go around clustering things that are even remotely close to each other, you get these high mass, uh, these, these apparently high mass jets, fat jets, uh, from this. And so this accidental substructure could be a discriminator um, between uh, new physics and QCD. So this is another kind of idea. Um, and this is, and, and I, I don't know, I, I wanted to give this a try. I've already started kind of looking at some techniques for this. But the, the, all I had left was just my conclusion. So I wanted to kind of emphasize that I think that these low met signatures are absolutely necessary, right? I mean, so they are, they are the, the sort of uh, complementary cousin to, uh, to the high net searches and, and need to be done. Um, and probably need to be done, you know, even starting out of them too. Um, and self, I think generally, I, I, I've tried to illustrate that I, I think it's a fairly general mechanism for converting missing energy to hadronic energy. Um, and so far we've only set limits, but uh, we're looking at a wide array of possible signatures and a wide array of possible uh, new <coughs> ideas. So, in your background for the uh, decay of the cyst, you have uh, gluons as uh, jet producers. Yeah. But do you protect uh, as uh, from decaying to quarks? I uh, we we do in the model, but I don't think it's necessary. Like I think in, you're you're asking what how things would change if we had S going to just quark and quark. Uh, well, it will change a lot because if S can go to quarks, it will it will also go to leptons. Yes, oh, sh yeah, absolutely. But we can imagine, I mean, so, but uh, the original motivation, I mean, so, that's right, and, and it would show up in, you know, like, six lepton final states, absolutely. But I just, uh, my general idea was to make something which would be as difficult to distinguish from the background as possible. I think, you know, once we start making um, 50 GeV, like, you know, four 50 GeV leptons, start figuring that we can find it in, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. Oh, you're, you're wondering what is the object? Yeah. Uh... <coughs> right. So, so that I assume can happen, but the the, the coupling to leptons will just be smaller, um, and as a result, you'll get like this will be suppressed with respect to the QCD production. So, when you start with photon, did you look for? Uh, Right as well. We did not. We we confined ourselves only to left-handed squares, and I think uh, just for simplicity, I, 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 there was no. In, in fact, in the original analysis, we did not do this, uh, and as a result, it's a little bit difficult to compare between the two. But I think that I mean, this would just this would increase your cross section as well. Yeah. Increase your your predicted cross section. But as long as you look for a photon, it should be coupled from. Right and left, right? Absolutely. Uh, it, it definitely would in any realistic model. The reason I think these are done, these simplified models, is just to make it as easy as possible on the theorists to extract uh, our efficiencies. Um, so if you if you extract, so you can extract out our assumptions and then put in whatever your own ones and set your own limits. So we do this essentially for the model purpose, uh, to make it as easy as possible to pull out our model assumptions. But you're right, in any realistic theory, you'd see it
Any other questions or comments? Again, the issue with the on page fifteen. Fifteen. That one. Yeah. So your your bit is way too big. That way too good. I mean, well, I mean, I would argue it's sort of you know reasonable. So in this, the data is within about half a sigma of the backward expectation. Here, it's within about a sigma. So what was the issue with the first? Uh, the first one, so so we can't take this into account because here it is contrived to match up exactly. So this is exactly the region where we normalize. So the fact that it passes through the middle here and here is is, is um, surprising. It is, it is required. So the, uh, just to, I'll, I'll go back a little bit and just uh, just to emphasize, uh, the background shape comes from the the low jet multiplicity sideband, but the normalization comes from the low ST sideband, and it's exactly that shaded region where they match up exactly. So that's exactly the normalization that's being done. The, the curve itself is being fixed to the number of events in the sideband. So how, how do you choose this particular sideband? Uh, Can we bump? Here, so yeah. You... So we were, we were squeezed a little bit on both sides. Uh, so on the one hand, you would like to set it as high as possible. Um, it, you. You'd like to, so on one hand, you, you're, you're sort of required to set it as high as possible because it must be above this turn on point. So, so, you know, like if we imagine that there's a corresponding diagram like this, uh, so I haven't shown it here, but it would fall, you know, somewhere back here, for example. Um, sorry. So, you have to push it up as high as possible to ensure that you're above the point where it turns on, but you don't want to set it so high that you start to become contaminated by signal. And one of the things that we had to do, that we had to seriously worry about, was um, whether or not uh, signal points would start to contaminate our sideband. And, and we, we did a study where we showed that for any, any point that would be significantly contaminated by our signal was already excluded by the previous analysis. So we were, we were safe from this. But it was, it was actually it was a little bit of a closer call than it would have been. The previous analysis, the previous, yeah, so we, had to, we went back and, and extracted the model that had the limits there. Um, that, that gets you down further, although it, you might argue that uh, that it would be proper, maybe, like, I think by convention in Susie we don't usually do that, but it's true that at some point you you run into the assumption um, that you are, you're, not, you're not signal contaminated in your control region. Any final question? Yeah, I just want to Thank you.